In my previous uploaded video, I have saved this model with this new name ending with uh, 0.7 IG, but till now I have didn't apply the changes required for the modifiers of the shear wall. We need to do this by going to the wall sections, clicking on this shear wall, modify show option, and we need to here to modify the F22 to 0.7. In this case, I'm considering the shear wall to be uncrack, okay? But what is the meaning of those uh, stiffness modifiers? Today, in this uh, video, I aim to show you the real meaning of each of those modifiers. And let me remind you that we have already applied the changes to the stiffness modifier of the other components like columns, slabs, and coupling beam. I have applied these changes in tutorial number 5, okay? And that's why actually I have just changed the stiffness modifier of the shear wall and this ETAPS model because we have already applied the changes to the rest of the components, okay? Jumping into this PowerPoint presentation, we need first to understand the mechanics of cracking a concrete member and what is even the reason of reducing the stiffness of those members. Cracking occurs in concrete when the tensile forces within the concrete member exceed the tensile capacity of the concrete due to a combination of tension, bending, and shear forces. Although steel reinforcing is generally provided in concrete members to support tension forces, the process of concrete cracking can significantly reduce the stiffness of the member. And before jumping into our finite element analysis software, let's touch on a very basic first principle concept. Considering a very simple rectangular concrete member in bending, Cracking doesn't occur at low levels of loading. This is very important. This means that the section is uncracked and therefore the full cross-sectional area is effective. Therefore, we should expect to have a linear stress distribution under low level of loading. Also, the stiffness of any member is just uh, represented by its youngest modulus and the second moment of inertia. Of course, for rectangular member, it is equal to bh cube over 12, okay? As the bending increases in the member, the stress will eventually reach a point where the tension capacity of the concrete is exceeded. At this point, the tension reinforcement provides the resistance to the tension within the section. Okay, therefore, if any member have excessive loading or it reaches a point where the applied load are much larger than the capacity of the section itself, we should expect that this member will crack, okay? And this will reduce the stiffness or the effective stiffness of the member. And at the end, after the cracking happens, the stress distribution within the same section will now look like this. The stress distribution now is not linear as the first case. Now the tension reinforcement are resisting the tension forces, while the above part of the concrete is resisting the compressive forces and the relation of stress distribution now is not linear, okay? Now the cracked zone in the concrete member is represented as the white space here in the cross section above, okay? Therefore, the, the reduction in this uh, stiffness of concrete due to cracking is a phenomenon which need to be accurately accounted for in structural analysis, okay? Now going to the stiffness modifiers in the tabs, what is the real meaning of those modifiers? Now that we know the mechanics of cracking in concrete member and the importance of modeling this behavior accurately, let's now look at how to mimic this behavior for shear walls within ETAPS. From this dialog box, we can see that there are a few stiffness modifier options to choose from, as shown here in this figure. And in order to understand the stiffness modifiers effectively, we need to check this figure here, this photo, okay? As shown here, this is a shell element that have its own local axes, we have three axes, one, two, three, okay? And to make it clear, let's continue reading before uh, explaining the photo above. The coordinate system, one, two, three, represent the left, right, up, down, and out direction on the screen, okay? Left, right, up, down, and in, out. Each face of the wall cube is then given a name. Face one is the left and the right faces, perpendicular to local axis number one. Face two is the top and the bottom faces, perpendicular to local axis number two and phases three is the near and the far faces perpendicular to local axis number three. The axis convention for each stiffness modifier within ETAPS is then given by a force followed by the name of the face then followed by the direction of the force. 
For example, F23 is the axial force acting on face number 2 in the direction of local axis number 3. Additionally, the stiffness modifier F22 corresponds to an axial force acting on phase 2, acting in the up or downward direction, because local axis number 2 in shear wall or shell elements of shear wall are aligned in the Z direction, okay? I have included also more information about the stiffness modifiers. All of those information I have uh, obtained them from the CSI website. In ETAP, shell or area element has two types of stiffness. In-plane stiffness refers as F11, F22 or F12. And the out-of-plane stiffness refers as M11, M22, M12. I always mention in my previous videos that the M's refer to the out-of-plane modifiers and the F's refers to the in-plane modifiers, okay? For shear wall, the flexural and axial behavior is modified by either F11 or F22 depending on the orientation of the local axis. And if you all remember, while I'm drawing my structural component like shear walls, I always show the local axis in order to ensure that all shell elements have the same orientation of the local axis. And by default, the local axis number 2 is oriented in the Z direction, okay? When drawing any tabs, the default is to have the local axis 1 horizontal and the local axis 2 vertical, as I'm mentioning before. This means that the flexural modifier for EI should be applied to F22 for wall piers and to F11 for spandrels. If you apply the modifier to both F11 and F22, it's hardly affect the results. You should modify the stiffness F22 of the horizontal section, phase 2, for piers and shear walls because it is the section that resists the bending moment. In the same manner, we should modify the stiffness F11 of the vertical section, phase 1, for spandrels and shear walls because it is the section that resists the bending moments. And if you want to think about it in a different way, for example, if we come to this uh, last slide, as shown here, this is a shear wall coupled with a coupling beam here at the middle. There is a tensile stresses or forces developed at this side while a compressive stresses forces at this side due to this lateral load, okay? But what we can notice that we are interesting to know the bending moments here at the base. This section called the horizontal section, okay? This is the horizontal section. While for vertical section, if we come back to this photo, if we zoom in to this coupling beam more and more and we put it here, we can see that we are interesting in the bending moments that are located on the vertical section, okay? And that's why we are reducing F11. Therefore, we are reducing the F22 because it is the axial force acting on the horizontal section, while we are reducing F11 because it is the axial force acting on this vertical section, okay? Also, before leaving this slide, guys, I want to show you, or let's focus here on this strain distribution. As all of you know that the stresses and the strains are uh, dependent on each other, and we can compute the stresses from strains using Hooke's law, okay? It's defined as the stress equal to modulus of elasticity multiplied by the strains. Therefore, we should expect that the stresses have the same linear stress distribution of strains, okay? And I'm telling you this because I want from you to imagine that F22 is just something similar to these strains here or to the shape of those strains. Because F22 is at the end, it is an axial force acting on face number 2 in the direction of local axis number 2. Then it is just similar to this shape here. And similarly, if we go to the coupling beam, as shown here, due to the applied loads or due to the lateral load, we will get this linear stress distribution on this face. Therefore, I want to reduce F11 because it is the stress acting on face number 1 in the direction of local axis number 1. And in same manner, I want to reduce the out of a plane modifiers for coupling beam to 0.35 because due to those gravity loads, this beam will bend in the out of plane, okay? Therefore, if we go to ETAPS, I have a changed F11 and the out of plane modifiers to 0.35 for coupling beam. Okay? I think the idea should be clear now why we are reducing F11, F22, and these stuff for members and in different ways. Also, we can check this photo to understand more about the in plane and out of plane behavior of shear wall. For example, if a force is applied in this direction, this will result in in plane bending 
while if the force applied in this direction, this will result in out of plane bending. Of course, we normally design the shear wall to resist the in plane, while for the out of plane, we will align a different walls in the other direction and we will assume that this uh, shear wall will not resist too much in the out of plane and that's why actually we always reduce the out of plane modifiers to 0.25. I'm assuming that this shear wall is weak in resisting the out of plane bending and I want the other shear walls aligned in the other direction to resist the applied loads. Lastly, I want to show you this example that I have taken from my friend Facebook page. He's called Kim Ling Kai. He have uh, created four shear walls here and he's trying to uh, check the effect of changing the stiffness modifiers on the overall response of those shear walls, okay? He have assigned the same loading at the top of each of those shear walls and he have here obtained the displacement due to the above load, okay? And as shown here, the first and the third model are actually very similar to each other because the displacement obtained here is 62.48 and for this one, it is 62.62. This means that those results are very close to each other. And changing F11 is not related to the flexural stiffness of this shear wall. Uh, similarly, if we check the second and the fourth shear wall, we can see that we have obtained very close uh, results of displacement. It is here 87.33, while here it is 87.46. Therefore, this confirms what we have read before. As mentioned in this statement, if you apply the modifier to both F11 and F22, it's hardly affect the results. And this is confirmed from the second and the fourth model of those shear walls. Also, we created two cases, uh, one with uncracked section and the second model with the crack section. Of course, uh, the second model have lower stiffness. This will result in higher displacement. And lastly, he have shown this table to indicate that there is two types of analysis that we need to conduct. The first one is called serviceability limit state, and this model is used to check the wind load because normally we design building to remain in the elastic range under wind loads. While if we are designing this structure for earthquake loads, we need to change the stiffnesses for those values and this model called ultimate limit state model or condition actually. And that's all for this tutorial. I hope you find it useful and please continue watching my next video.